Well, it is a beautiful day out there. Uh, it's a great to be with you. We're, we know we are between two of the Holy Days, uh, Pentecost coming up, and for many, uh, I suppose, in the world, it seems like uh, it's a routine that we repeat every year, but it keeps us in, in mindset of God's plan, of God's way of life. Those who no longer observe the Holy Days, those who who abandon the Holy Days, they soon lose knowledge of the plan of God. I remember years ago when we were organizing a feast site in Hawaii, uh, my wife had a strained muscle in her neck, and we found some lady to do some massages. She wanted to know why we were there. And we said, well, you know, it's a church observance that we observe every year. And she said, uh, well, what observance is that? And my wife said, well, it is the Feast of Tabernacles. And she smiled, and she used to be a member of the Worldwide Church of God. She forgot all about it, that this is even the season of it. So it does keep us in mind. Same, of course, for the Sabbath as well. Well, we know the world at large is a mess, with the nations continually arming themselves, expenditures amazingly up there. They, they're considering many nations the possibility of war of Russia and China as we analyze it. We know that they are preparing, at least preparing for the thought of really as far as Europe, fighting in Europe, and of course uh, the whole Western world, and Western world primarily of descendants of Israel. And uh, our, let's say our view of the immediate future is not... It's not encouraging when we think about the dangers out there. War is raging in Israel or Judah, of course, with the Palestinians and Hamas. And I think it's kind of an irony that the capital of Judah, uh, of course, the city of Jerusalem, the Hebrew translated word Jerusalem, according to Strong's, means foundation of peace, city of peace. And, of course, the irony is that currently Jerusalem is at least the headquarters, the city of war, at least with Hamas at the current time, potentially surrounding nations as well. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 2 mentions Jerusalem as that city that is anything but peace in the future. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 2 And it says in verse 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness. Of course, that's trembling in the uh, King James. To all the surrounding peoples, when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Well, we understand that Jerusalem will be the city of peace in the future. We look forward to that time. It's exciting to think about it. Uh, the city of peace, the government of God in the millennium where peace flows and the knowledge of God flows out from Jerusalem. But it's far from the city of peace today. Of course, the, we call it Israel, but the nation of Judah. And it seems like all the surrounding nations want to see it destroyed and literally run into the sea. You know, that, that's really their religious outlook as far as how they see it and what they think is rightfully theirs. Well, we're not going to see literally peace among nations in the immediate future. Of course, then when Christ returns, things are going to change. They're going to change rapidly. Jesus Christ will establish himself as the King of Kings, the creator of the universe. And we realize not all peoples will believe that to start with. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some education. It's going to take a, a, a little bit of a showing of power that only the creator could show. Well, we understand that the time is coming. There will be all-out war, that unless God intervenes, there will be no flesh left alive on the planet, Matthew 24, 22. Well, in contrast, the world, of course, will not see that peace. We don't see that peace today. We don't see that kind of peace among nations today. But we have the possibility of having peace, peace of mind, peace in our heart, 
among the people of God. That is, even in a very difficult and trying age, you know, even in our personal lives, we're tested often, aren't we? Things don't always go right, and we're not totally at peace, at least peace of mind and in inner heart. And of course, we know that that time is coming. And I might ask, is it possible to have peace of mind for us today in a time of trouble, in a very dangerous world, when things can go wrong, even in our own communities? John chapter 14 and verse 27. John 14 and verse 27. Christ said something that I think uh, we can key into concerning our own thoughts related to peace. John 14, verse 27, Christ said, Peace I leave with you. In other words, the peace of mind, potentially, that we can have must come from God, from Jesus Christ as well. My peace I give to you, to the people of God, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, Neither let it be afraid. You know, there's so many scriptures that reference the thought, almost a command, do not be afraid, do not fear. Of course, that's a, that's a challenge in this day and age. It's a challenge when sometimes things seem to be going against us, whether it's financially or health or this or that. But Christ said, peace I leave with you. In other words, it can come from the great God. It's not something that we just dream up, you know, don't, don't worry, be happy. That might be some of the world's philosophy. But we have access to the true God. We can obtain peace in time. So what is this peace that Christ stated he would give us? You know, can we have that peace? Do we experience some of that peace of mind, peace of heart? I like to look at the peace that Christ says he offers, that God himself offers. I give it a title, Acquiring the Peace of God. And I might say, the peace of God in a very difficult world, as we all know. When things don't seem to go right, Satan is always there. He's stirring the pot. He's behind the scenes. He's transmitting his mindset at times to us that we have to resist. And I think we should keep in mind that having peace does not mean being totally free of troubles. Not in this age, not in this world. We're going to have trouble. We look forward into the future and we will see more situations that maybe alarm us. And maybe we see society begin to collapse. We see the economy begin to change. Now they speak of it as black swans. In other words, circumstances that you can't imagine ahead of time. But out of nowhere it occurs, like COVID. But of course, possibly things much worse. Christ spoke of his peace. You notice that? His peace. This was a time, of course, he was rejected by the Jewish leadership at the time, and he was about to be executed. And yet he was able to say, my peace I leave with you. In an extremely difficult time, we know Christ even sweat Drops of blood at one point in time. But he still said, my peace, I leave with you. And we can have access to that peace, but it takes effort. It's not going to just happen on its own. It takes effort, and we'll look at some scriptures that, that basically state that. We have to seek it. We have to pursue it. It involves a change of mind, literally, a change of mindset. And God wants us to have that. Is God at peace? Is Christ at peace now? Absolutely. You know, they're stable. They're in control. Of course, we're not always in control, but our great God is in control. And we can always go to him and ask his intervention in our life to kind of settle us down. You know, a peaceful state of mind really is something that is, of course, uh, building relationships in families, among church members, when we have a peace of mind, we're typically more at peace with others when we have a peace of mind. And that's something that's, you know, God wants among his family, among his people. Well, the Apostle Paul spoke of that same peace even while he was 
imprisoned or house arrest, we'll say he was in prison. Philippians 4, 7. And it's amazing how one can think of a, pe a peaceful state of mind in such extreme duress. Sometimes we have our own extreme duress. And of course, God sees us through, as King David said, as he so often said. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. Philippians 4 and verse 7. Breaking into a thought, we'll look at this in more detail. Verse 7. And the peace of God, notice that it is of God. It's not something we just work up on our own. The peace of God, from God. Even the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Literally, it doesn't make sense in the physical material world how you can have peace of mind when things aren't going well or perfectly, maybe, as you might like, as I might like. Surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, we can have access to that peace. And a person might wonder, okay, Paul was incarcerated, we'll say, at this point in time, and he was speaking about peace, peace, peace of mind that surpasses all understanding. And, of course, anybody else looking on the Apostle Paul at that time would say, how in the world can you be at peace? You know, you don't know your future. You're incarcerated. You may meet your death in the future. You don't know. And yet, that peace of God he spoke of, or from God, surpasses all normal human understanding. Like, you know, how can you be at peace under these circumstances? Well... The Greek word translated peace, according to Strong's, means at one. You know, kind of at one, not scattered mind, but at one, quietness, rest. You know, isn't it pleasant to be at a, a peaceful state of mind? You're not, obviously you're not anxious or worried or stressed. You're, you have a peace of mind. Well, that's what God wants us to obtain. He's willing to give us a peace of mind, but as we'll see soon, we have to seek it. We have to go after it. It takes work. We can't just sit back and, and ask God to just deliver peace without following God's formula for peace of mind, for stability. Well, I think, again, it's, it's interesting that the peace of God that Paul was talking about passes all normal human understanding. It's kind of like it doesn't make sense. It's not logical to people in the world. Now, you could be at peace. In other words, the, the average person out there would think, well, you've got every right to be stressed and, and anxious and worried, having panic attacks or whatever. <clears throat> Let's say you're, you're stuck in a crisis and you fear the worst, which sometimes happens in our mind. Well, the average human being, of course, thinks, how in the world can I be at peace at this moment in time? I face this possible situation, the, the outcome that I don't know how to deal with it, looking forward into the future. Well, we can understand that this is the peace of God, the peace from God. It's not, not just our own normal mindset. We have to... Think about the very character of God. Is God at peace? Absolutely. Well, we, we all have, to some degree, of course, uh, we still have some human nature we're working with, trying to align ourselves. Kind of I think of it as kind of a mind transplant, the plan of God, from what we were to what he wants us to become. A mind transplant. Fortunately, it's not a brain transplant, but, you know, a mind transplant. It takes work. It takes effort. You know, it, it's so extremely, as mentioned in the sermonette, it's so extremely difficult to change, let's say, the human mind as far as our patterns, the way of thinking, uh, incredibly. So it's like we have a set point with a computer. And we get under stress, we go back to the set point so often, so many times. Well, we have access to peace, and that's something we should want to acquire. Something that takes effort. 
You know, it takes action on our part to acquire that peace from God. You know, some, maybe neighbors or friends or whatever, under certain circumstances, they might be thinking, you should be panicking, but you're not. You should be extremely fearful, maybe, in certain situations, but you're not. Now, how can that be? So how do we acquire the peace of mind and heart that God wants us to have? That, you know, basically, he wants that mindset for his family. You know, we want to have a stable, peaceful mind that we'll need, of course, in the millennium, or fully spirit beings, but we will still need to function with a peace of mind and heart, with direction. Well, it's all part of the very character of the great God. And he wants to give us more of that character. You know, we're his potential children, begotten children, you know, generally parents want their children to grow up to be more like them, at least, in, at least in principle, maybe not in appearance, but in principle. And that's exactly what God wants. He wants a family that thinks like he does, you know, that thinks like he does when it comes to the plan, when it comes to the future as well. Well, Scripture says that we have to go after it. In other words, we can't just kick back and expect God to dump a load of peace on us, so to speak, to use a vernacular. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And let's start with verse 10. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. And it starts out in verse 10. For he who would love life... You know, and, and we do. We want to love life, the life that God is offering, eternal life. He who would love life and see good days. We all want to see good days. Maybe there's going to be less of it in the immediate future before Christ returns. But we're looking forward to the kingdom of God. You know, we think about how exciting that would be to have the ability and the resources to help people. You know, outgoing concern and to see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Well, this is all part of God's purpose. We have to learn to control our tongue, control our mind. Uh, difficult, but it can be done. Reprogramming the mind over the years. And his lips from speaking deceit. Obviously, we have to speak the truth. That's the foundation, I think, of God's law. The truth. And let him turn away from evil and do good. You know, we reject evil, but we still have to do good. It takes doing good on our part that really fit into the plan of God. That's the whole purpose of the firstborn children of God in the millennium, doing good, working with people, stabilizing them, helping them arrive at a mind of peace in spite of all the terror that has gone on and the warfare and finally, in verse 11, it says, Let him seek peace and pursue it. It's something we have to pursue. We have to seek it. We have to pursue it. And again, we're still talking about kind of a mind change, developing more of the character of God. Seek peace and pursue it. You know, that peace of mind, of course, we're after at times when we face worries, concerns, fears. You know, we can still have a stabilizing peace of mind. We have every reason to have a stable peace of mind. We know this life is short. It's brief training from here on out to Christ's return, however many years that is. And we know we've got a future. We've got a real future. If we remain faithful, seek peace and pursue it. Let's go back to uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. And I emphasize again in this situation, uh, Paul, as he was writing to the Philippians, he was... He, was, he didn't have his freedom. He was under arrest. And he's writing these words as we see in verse 4. 
And it speaks about the process, and we'll look at it in more detail, the process of acquiring the peace of God, the peace of mind. And it says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. In other words, express some joy. It can be verbally, but in our mind, you're rejoicing about the future. It, rejoice over, you know, think about what God's given you, potential for eternal life. Think about being called as firstborn, you know, the, the better resurrection that we haven't earned or deserved, but God has called a few. What has God given us? He's given us the truth. We have the calling. He made the move in opening our mind. We didn't make the move initially. A calling, of course, receiving God's spirit, being chosen, that is, the, the elect, being part of God's family, eternal life yet to come. We've got so much to think about and the future that God is offering us. Even the opportunity, I think about this occasionally, to see our friends or our extended family who are not part of God's way, resurrected back to life. You know, you know the ones who thought we're all wet, we're all wrong, we went off the deep end somehow religiously, and we're going to help them see that we, in spite of their view of us, that we have been walking with God, not perfectly, but God's opened our mind, and they have the same blessing, the same opportunity as they experience the training and the teaching and, of course, the cooperation on their part. So we are encouraged to rejoice in the blessings of the plan of God. It's like, get real. I mean, is the future real to you or is it not? God wants us to get real with reality. The remaining part of our years will be brief. There'll be tests. There'll be trials. But we can still have peace of mind, the peace of God. Well, those blessings are all part of what God has offered us. And I think of all the people on earth, you know, we have the supreme blessing of that better resurrection as firstborn, Hebrews 11.35. And again, we know we, we haven't deserved it. We haven't earned it. We, weren't to, we didn't earn it because we, of our own intellect, could figure out the truth. You know, the most, the most probably some of the most studied individuals uh, may reside in some of the seminaries. You know, sometimes in the past we've thought of some of the seminaries as where the truth gets buried. Uh, you know, it's some of the cemeteries of truth. And, of course, it's, they, can, they can memorize whole sections, some do, of Scripture. Highly elevated degrees in theology. And they know the least of the truth of God. We, and here we are kind of Joe and, and uh, Joe Lett, average or, or, or less. And God has opened our mind. He's called us. And he's had his own reason for calling us. <clears throat> Maybe he came to the conclusion that we're capable of changing, of training, of changing, excuse me. Uh, that is with his help. We're capable of changing. We don't know it all when God was opening our mind. We we're ready to learn, to humble ourselves. Maybe that's a part of our calling. Again in, in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. And of course that's repetition. That's fairly rare I guess repetition. But when it occurs as we see here. This repetition. It is important. It is very important to God. We're, it, we're in the process of rejoicing. Of being joyful. You know, you know, we're looking forward in our mind to the future, no matter how circumstances are surrounding us or our health or our finances. You know, we're, we're joyful. We're, we're looking forward to the future. We're part of it. We have that opportunity. It's been given to us. Again, I say rejoice, the Apostle Paul said. Well, when we are in the process of mentally rejoicing, as it were, being joyful... You know, it is hard to be joyful, meaning the big picture in particular, 
and miserable at the same time. I mean, when you know you have such an outstanding, fantastic future, how can you be miserable? You know, you, you can't be both. And no matter what our circumstances are around us, you know, we can have an element of joy in our mind, part of the process of acquiring peace, knowing we're part of the future. We're not perfectly on track, but we're, we intend to continue changing and being part and ready at Jesus Christ's return. Well, rejoicing before God silently in our heart or our mind implies that we're thankful, doesn't it? When, you're, when you rejoice, you know, you're thankful about something. When we are consistently rejoicing of the awesome future of the great God that he has offered us, you know, we, we only understand a tiny part of this universe and what God intends to do with it. God has given us all, I guess we would say, all we need to know for the moment. But we inherit the universe. We'll have such an opportunity to make changes, first of all on planet Earth, then later the universe. So when we're in that mindset of rejoicing or being thankful, you know, we're not distracted by all the what-ifs of life. And during this very short training period, that we experience here on earth. You know, you can, one can go on and on with what if this happens and what if that happens and I don't know. I don't know how to handle it. You know, that's kind of being micro-sighted. We need to have the big sight, the big picture. We realize we've got a future. Uh, this life and this training will soon be over. It doesn't go on forever at this level. And we enter a time even of world peace. Uh, it'll take a little doing but that time is coming. And of course, in the meantime, we can have some of the peace of God, some of the mindset of heart and mind. But we know, as Scripture says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Not their purpose, but his purpose. Romans 8, 28. In other words, we know it's going to work out for the better. Some things don't seem like it at the time. And we wonder why this, why that, or why the other. And sometimes God is just simply allowing things to time and chance and see how we respond. Do we get despondent? Or do we have the bigger picture? Well, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5, back to verse 5, let your... Gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Well, the Greek word here translated gentleness, according to Strong's, means gentle, of course, mild, forbearing, fair, reasonable, moderate. Let your gentleness be known to all men. In other words, we're not radicals, you know, overly excitable, irritated, angry. We're mentally to a degree at peace. You have to have a mental level of, of peace to be gentle with others, knowing our future, but their potential future as well. So being gentle or reasonable with others tends to keep the peace, doesn't it? Peace between individuals. Peace in society. It tends to keep the peace in the church. You know, that's something we want. You know, something I've noticed after the last 20-some years, uh, coming, always coming home from Council of Elders meetings, you know, I've always, I've always been uplifted, encouraged, you know, it's not just the subjects, but it's the style of leadership that we have from, from uh, our leadership, our headquarters team, but all the Council of Elders that have a mindset of peace, not of argument, not with an agenda, not with their own purpose. You know, that's really the kind of mind of peace we need. We need to continue being led by God's Spirit, obviously. Of course, we can want to acquire that mind of peace in our own lives too 
in our own little circumstances, our own little corner of the world. Not being argumentative, actually being at peace with others tends to more likely result in our own peace of mind, that state of mind and heart. In James chapter 3, I'll come back to Philippians 4, but in James chapter 3 and verse 17, James chapter 3 verse 17, it speaks of some characteristics here of the great God as well. In verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable. You know, that's the mind of God. He wants us to be at peace, to be at peace with ourselves in one sense, a peaceful state of mind, of heart. Gentle, gentle, gentle with others, willing to yield, not always, in other words, not always having to be right, full of mercy. God shows us a lot of mercy, doesn't he? We don't ask him for justice. God wants us to develop the same character trait of mercy, being able to show mercy to others. Maybe we haven't even handled this right, but showing mercy. Maybe they don't deserve it, but God still wants us to develop that mind, that quality of mercy. It says, and good fruits, doing things for others in the right way. It's a big subject. Without partiality without hypocrisy. So James is speaking of here even a, a mind of peace. Peace of mind, of heart. And back to Philippians. Back to Philippians and verse 4. Chapter 4, rather. In verse 5. Let your gentleness be known to, to all men. The Lord is at hand. That's pretty strong worded. The Lord is at hand, of course, hopefully in our lives. According to Strong's at hand can mean the Lord is near. God is near. And he's working with us. He's aware of us. He's aware of areas we need to change. But we know we can trust him to guide us. And I sometimes even ask for gentle correction. I know I gave a sermon years ago on the subject of asking God for gentle correction. Not, not, not uh, give it to me, but gentle correction. And I remember one fringy person came up to me afterwards and said, you know, that's the last thing I would ever ask God for is correction. And I thought, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> thought, well, how can, we, how can we know what God wants us to work on? You know, if, if, why would we want anything else than gentle correction? Do we want strong correction? Do we want the day of the Lord? Of course not. Asking God for gentle correction, you know, show me uh, areas that I need to change so I can be more like you. Well, the Lord is at hand. And again, this can mean the at hand, the Lord's near. Hopefully near in our life, we're near the great God. And it seems to be saying also that we are at peace with others. Let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. You know, your gentleness, your, your, your mind of peace. You know, when we are at peace ourselves mentally or at peace with others, more likely we're at peace with God. We're closer to God. You know, we're looking at the reality of what God, how God wants us to respond. You know, with, with a, a thought that is not, I got to win this argument. You know, sometimes human nature takes us that way. Well, now we come to verse 6. And, and we will see here, I think of it as kind of a formula for developing a peace of mind, acquiring a peace of mind, a peace of God, the peace from God. And he starts out in this formula, I'll think it in that sense, uh, a formula that God wants us to follow. 
Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Well, that's uh, kind of easier said than done, isn't it? Be anxious for nothing. And of course it goes on from there. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. So Paul starts out in his formula for having a peace of mind, the peace of God, is to be anxious for nothing. To realize that it's not doing you any good. It's doing you harm physiologically, doing you harm. Of course, not being anxious is not something that comes easily, is it? You, know, you just can't tell yourself, quit being anxious. Well, that may make you a little more anxious if you're really stressed over it. <laughs> uh, uh, no, it doesn't work that way. You know, we all have some anxiety and some fears, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, you know, that just goes in Satan's society. It goes with our lack of perfection. And, and God understands to that degree, but he wants us to work out of that, working towards his mindset as well. Be anxious for nothing. Well, of course, that is a, a challenge, but that is what God wants us to at least work towards. Yeah, you know, realize, hey, I do need a peace of mind. I need a stable mindset. I need to, I need to work towards that. I need to seek peace and pursue it. And I need to follow, at least what we see here in scriptures, the process or the formula for developing more of a peace of mind. Beginning in verse 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing. And then what follows? Well, how do we get there? Being anxious for nothing or very little. How do we get there? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Well, that's kind of like in this course of action, we take our concern to God. We approach God as the first step. When we don't have a peaceful mindset, a stable mind, we go to God. We go to the, the creator of our mind and our brain and our body. Well, sometimes when we face a new worry or concern, maybe it's just come to light, as it were, we forget to do the obvious. You know, we're operating in the physical realm. We forget to do the obvious. We're not sure how we're going to handle it. How's this going to work out? And we forget to do the obvious. We can get so busy with our worrying, asking questions, you know, what's going to happen? Maybe mentally, how will I cope if this happens? Or maybe even, why me? You know, that we don't immediately approach God. Have you ever had any of those thoughts? You know, kind of, why me? Uh, you know, it's fairly common in their extreme stress and, and difficulty. But again, God has the answer. Well, what we perceive, our perceived reality of what may or may not come to pass, unfortunately, is real to us at that moment. It's real in our mindset. And you know, immediately when something like this sneaks up on us, it's time to seek God, as the scripture says. We have to seek God. It's time to move closer to God. And we know what that means as far as moving closer to God. You know, it, that takes some effort in itself. It's a whole lot more than just thinking happy thoughts. You know, we make a special effort moving closer to God. Maybe some difficulty or tragedy occurs. And I think approaching God and asking God, is there something I need to see? It's probably kind of step one. Is there something I need to see? We know King David had an abundance of fears. He was a normal human being, but he had a big heart and a, a big commitment to the great God. You know, you think about the potential fears and worries he had. His own father-in-law trying to kill him off. Man, that would be a worry. And his son, Absalom, tried, tried to overthrow him. Now, that's, a, that's an incredible threat. Other times he was surrounded by enemies. You know, he had a lot to be concerned about, to lack 
a peace of mind. And David quickly learned in those cases to seek God in the face of fear. To seek God. Psalm 27. Psalm 27 and verse 1. Think about David here and so many of his struggles. And he said in verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. He's going to extend me, potentially, eternal life, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And what kind of worry is going to take over my life? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be af afraid? And we could say, of what shall I be afraid? We're not, that's not always people. Circumstances, finances, danger, health, this and that. When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and, f and foes, they stumbled and fell. Well, maybe we don't have enemies, but we certainly have worries and fears at times. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. I'm not going to let it. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to pursue him. The war may rise against me. In this I will be confident. Rock solid confidence in the great God. Verse 5, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Of course, there can be big troubles and little troubles, but in essence, we can go to God for protection. It doesn't have to be a human enemy. He shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me, and he shall set me high upon a rock. You know, David had analogies of the high tower and the rock. When I read scriptures like this, I think of uh, El Capitan in, ha in Yosemite National Park, you know, 3,000 feet of vertical granite, you know, and David said, he'll set me upon a rock. And, and symbolically, God can do that with us as far as elevating us out of our worst fears, worries, anxieties, and our confidence can be rock solid in the great God. Maybe not rock solid in us, but rock solid in the great God. He's our father. He's our teacher. He's our trainer. He's always going to do what's best for us, even though it may be a little correction at times, as we know we need. <clears throat> well, this applied to David's many times of trouble, and it certainly applies to us today, no matter how big or how small. Verse 6 again. Flip back to Philippians 4. And verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, and here goes, let's say, the suggestions of how to overcome those fears and worries. But in everything, by prayer, it says in supplication, but you think about that, by prayer, we know what prayer is, and it says supplication. You know, supplication, what is supplication? Well, according to the commentaries, it means praying for a specific Heartfelt need, you know, repeatedly going to God. It's heartfelt. We're not making demands of God, but it's something heartfelt we feel like we really need. And, and hopefully we spell it out in spiritual terms. We're trying to show God at whatever level he intervenes or we'd like him to intervene. Uh, uh, we're we're going to benefit or others are going to benefit spiritually in some way. You know, we base our discussion with God based on spiritual principles, how we or our family or our congregation or others are going to benefit somehow, some way spiritually. And, you know, God will listen. Now, that's the high priority. God will listen. 
in first, so we're going to think about supplication for a moment. We already know and we approach God in prayer, but in supplication in this formula requiring peace of mind, we involve supplication. You know, we repeatedly go to God in heartfelt prayer. It's, it's from within. God says, seek me with all your heart and I will be found. And of course we do that. You know, sometimes it's heightened when we think we're under danger, circumstances, but we go to God often and God responds. And we can be, it might sound like a redundant going to God more than once, but God wants to see if we remain in faith or we get disappointed because it doesn't whatever happen. In 1 Timothy 5, 5, it mentions widows who are genuine widows, at least losing a spouse, losing a husband. And it says in 1 Timothy 5, 5, now she who is really a widow and left alone, you know, that's, that's seemingly a sad state, but of course, potentially, we'll see our mates again. She trusts in God, continues in supplications, goes to God repeatedly with heartfelt prayers, needs, day and night, it says. So, you know, we never make demands of God, but we try to spell it out to God. You know, what we're, what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, what we need from God according to his will, how, how we can or others can benefit spiritually, whatever we're asking for, supplication. So when we approach God in supplication, we're going to approach him in a very heartfelt way. That's part of supplication. You know, it's not just check off list things to pray for, but it's, okay, it's part of our core. It's kind of what's, what's, uh, we're involved in our mind, our heart as well. Repeatedly going to God with heartfelt supplication. And again, we may make our case like we find in Isaiah 1, verse 18. We make our case, but we don't argue with God. We don't want something just because I want it. And we, whatever we're considering, uh, we try to present a spiritual benefit some way, somehow, even if what we're after, in some cases it might be a physical need, but we try to present what is the spiritual benefit in God intervening. After all, that is his high priority. Yes, he will take care of our physical needs, but we also need to, when we're asking for things, to spell out, you know, reason with God, not argue with God, help him from to see at least what's in our heart, that there is some spiritual benefit, whatever we're seeking here. So we are to go to God with supplication, and it continues in verse 6, with thanksgiving. It says, supplication with thanksgiving. Well, this is another step in a formula for a peaceful state of mind, that Paul mentions as well. And in reality, we understand that our tests and our trials will come to an end with, it says, thanksgiving. And there are so many things that we can be thankful for, isn't there? And we're told repeatedly that God will respond to us if we seek him with all our heart. You know, incredible blessings that God has offered us in the future. You think about, well, this life is, I've often thought, is only training. That's all it is, is training for the kingdom of God, for our real career. Again, in my analogy, when we graduate at Christ's return, we move on to our real career. What we're doing now, it's important what we do, but what we're really being trained for is a, is a responsibility of outgoing concern in the family of God for others. Incredibly blessed in that case. Well, we find that in, in uh, Jeremiah, as far as seeking God with all our heart, in Jeremiah 29. In 
and verse 13. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. I mentioned this earlier. Maybe I should start a little bit earlier in that chapter. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. And Jeremiah states, or God states, in this case through Jeremiah, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Eternal. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. A future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And here's where prayer and supplication. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, and I will be found by you. You know, incredible, incredible blessings we see. We approach God in this way. We know he hears us. We've got a lot to be thankful for, our great God. We can thank God for hearing us out, providing a way of escape, so to speak. We know 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I'll mention it very briefly here. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Paul says to the Corinthians, no temptation, we might say also, no trial as overtaking you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, will not allow you to be tempted or tested or tried beyond what you are able. He knows he can read us better than we can read us. But with that temptation, with that trial, we'll also make the way of escape. God has a way that you may be able to bear it. And of course, bearing it is not forever, whatever we're talking about. We can take God at his word. Though God may not respond in exactly the way we might be requesting or we might be thinking, but he always does what's best for us. I think about that so often. Even, in, even when anointing people, I think that, sometimes I mention that, God always does what's best for us. You know, obviously, we like to be healed right now, and that make, that's, that's normal and that's natural. But when God doesn't heal, you know, he's got something else in mind. He's working with us. You know, the, great, the greatest being made whole is that Christ return. God always does what's best for us. Sometimes it may... It may hurt a little bit, a little bit of correction or gentle correction. But he has our good, our long-term good in mind. He wants us to succeed, to be a part of the very family of God. And we can take God at his word. And back to Philippians 4 and verse 6 again. And again, we're speaking about a formula here of developing the peace of God, the peace from God, the peace of mind and heart. Rereading again some of it. Be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And then it says at that point, let your request be known to God. God says, you know, bring it to me. When we take our cares our concern to God in this way, we begin to receive peace that comes from God. Okay, we know we're in contact with the Creator. He's on the job. He's aware of us. He's not necessarily going to respond in, in, in our time frame or in our way, but he's going to do what's best for us. He wants to see that we succeed, that we become part of the very family of God. Verse 7 Verse 7, and the peace of God, this is the conclusion of those suggestions for developing the peace of God, the peace of mind, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It's not logical to the physical world, human beings, 
will guard your heart, it says, and minds through Christ Jesus. Well, that's encouraging, isn't it? If, if we believe God, we believe what he says, you know, he's going to guard our heart, our mind. We're going to have that stable mindset. You know, we may be for, facing the same concern for the moment, but we know God is on the job. He, he hears us. He will see us through one way or another. He intends for us to succeed. You know, he has a big investment in us. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, he's saying, get your mind in shape. Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So the Apostle Paul's concludes his formula for that peace of God, the peace of mind that surpasses all reasonable worldly understanding, I guess, you know, as well. Well, it's a command to immerse our mind and meditate, of course, on these things. The truth of God, the very character of God, that character God will show and share with us. So whatever things are true, well, you know, we're all about truth, aren't we? We are sanctified by the truth, John 17, 19. That, that makes us unique to God, special to God. We want to be special to God. We're sanctified by the truth to the extent we keep it, we maintain it, we live it, not just know it, but we live it. So in other words, we are set apart and made special to God by that truth that God is the one who's given it to us in the first place. Hasn't the truth that God has brought into your life, you know, you think about your future, you know, how awesome it is, and it hasn't that and more made life worth living? No, it's difficult for a brief period of training to be born into the family of God. And he says, whatever things are noble. He's talking about, okay, let's set our mind on some of these. Let's don't think of primarily the evil, the bad, woe is me. But let's get with a healthy state of mind. Whatever things are noble. In Rome, nobleness had to do with living up to one's civic duties and responsibilities. In this case, nobleness refers to living up to our responsibilities and our duties for the coming kingdom of God. That applies to support of the work, support of the brethren as well, in our prayers, our tithes and offerings to the church, and our example to the world as well. We're told, now we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us, we implore you in Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5.20, ambassadors, living up to our duties in the world, being good representatives, ambassadors. He goes on to say in verse 8, whatever things are just, whatever things are right or just that conforms to God's standards, being totally honest in business is one example. Whatever things are pure, you know, it refers to more so the morally pure, which the world totally lacks, which seems to be morally pure. It's totally opposite of what we see in society today, even more so year by year. When we think of moral purity, we might think of the principles of God in marriage, strong families, with children raised according to God's purpose and God's way of life, whatever things are pure, the purity of the God family. And then whatever things are lovely refers to the things that are pleasing in God's sight. You know, brethren and helping brethren, our prayers for the work, our prayers for each other. 
whatever things are of a good report, and whatever is praiseworthy rings true by God's standards. You know, the, the world's entertainment venues don't fit here. Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, Paul suggests that we give it some thought. He says, think on these things. In other words, let's meditate about it. Think logically, rationally, that God's virtues, God's character, the character he wants to share with us, become another junior member of the family, God's character traits. And he goes on to say in verse 8, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. In other words, keep your mind open to the things of God, things you haven't seen yet, maybe in your studies, the good things of God's way of life, his plan, his purpose, the future he's called you to. And in verse 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace, the one who brings peace, potentially, if we allow him to our mind, a peaceful mind, a peaceful heart, the God of peace will be with you. You'll be an example of a stable mind with a view of the future. You know, we live in a very scary and evil world that is not supportive of God's way of life. And you know, the scripture says God provides a way of escape. God provides a fantastic future for us, an amazing future for us. And God wants us to have a stable mind. And having a peaceful mind is part of that stability. There's more. God doesn't want us to be overwrought with anxiety and fear. You know, we're, when we are, we're kind of distancing ourselves from God to some degree. You know, we need to go to God. We know his character, his mindset of peace, his desire to see us succeed. God offers that peace of mind that surpasses all understanding, incredibly so. It doesn't make sense to the world how sometimes when we're under certain conditions, we could be at peace. I remember, I remember a few days ago, one of our members and one of our pastors had a sudden fast infection, incredibly so. I think she was in her mid-60s, and she was healthy otherwise, and one thing led to another, and I wasn't sure that she would survive in the hospital. And finally she said, you know, I'm okay. I trust God. If this is my time, that's fine with me. I trust the great God. And of course, she had a mind of peace, a stable, peaceful mind, and she did die. You know, God, for whatever reason, you know, sometimes he keeps individuals from the evil to come, whether worldwide or locally or, or whatever the case may be. Well, that is something that God offers us, you know. Again, the point is we have to seek it. We have to pursue it. We have to work at it. It takes action, but it all comes from the great God. We don't generate it, you know, let's say, but of and by ourselves. So hopefully, you know, we appreciate what God is offering, even in the present, you know, a peaceful mind, a peaceful heart, in spite of whatever disabilities, seek things that don't go right in our life, we know we have a real future. We have a future in the family of God. In turn, we must seek peace and pursue it. We have to put ourselves into seeking a peaceful state of mind.